how to legally start your coaching business. If you're like, yes, please talk to me about how do I get my business set up? What do I need to have in place from a legal standpoint? You're in luck because we're gonna get into it right now. Hey, hey, Courtney Sanders here. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new to me, I'm a full-time certified seven-figure life and business coach, as well as wife and mom. I wear all the hats and do all the things. Say that three times fast. Whew, that's a tongue twister, but there's a lot going on over here in my coaching business that I've been able to achieve. And I'm really excited about helping new entrepreneurs, particularly new online coaches and new online entrepreneurs achieve the same, which is why in this video, I wanted to talk about how to legally start your coaching business. And this is actually my bad, right? My fault in the sense that I recognize that I haven't really talked about legally getting your stuff set up on this channel. And the reason for that is because I assumed that a lot of this was common knowledge, but it wasn't until, you know, I started getting a lot of questions around this that I said, you know what, this probably <laughs> deserves a video. You know, I've been in business for a really long time. I've been um, coaching really since 2011, but um, more seriously since 2014. And I've been full-time in my business since 2016. So a lot of this uh, legal stuff that I had to do in the beginning is a bit old hat for me because I set this up, uh, you know, a long time ago. And even some things that I've had to do uh, recently, again, I've been so focused on growing my own business that I just assumed that most of you were in the know as well. And so if you're like, yes, please talk to me about how do I get my business set up? What do I need to have in place from a legal standpoint? You're in luck because we're going to get into it right now. All right, so if I were like starting all over again, and in many respects, I kind of am because I am in the process of setting up brand new businesses. So, you know, I have my coaching business, but there's other businesses that I'm kind of spinning off into based on um, the growth of my company. I have um, a staffing agency that I'm working on. I have a done for you service that I've talked about in other videos where my team will basically sell your coaching program for you. We'll build your entire brand. We'll, you know, do all those things. So um, we're kind of in beta right now. We have some uh, tester clients that we're working on. So if that's something of interest to you, I'll make sure that there's links below um, in the video, but I try not to promote it too much because I'm like, we're not ready yet, right? We're just, we're just working with our initial clients. But in the process of this, I am kind of going through a lot of these steps all over again. So, you know, even for me, a lot of this is really relevant, even though in my coaching business, I've done this for a long time. And so the first step that I'm taking on those new businesses that I recommend that you take, if you are looking to legally set up your coaching business is you need to come up with a business entity or you need to set up a business entity. Now I know this is different all over the world. Um, I work with a lot of people in South Africa and so they're focused on building what's known as PTY limiteds. Um, but here, here in the US, primarily what you'll hear a lot of people talk about is an LLC, which is a limited liability company. Now, legal disclaimer, right? This is not legal advice. And there are several different types of business entities that you can set up. An LLC is not the only one. However, it's often the most popular because the main point of an LLC, again, limited liability company, is that you are setting up an entity that is going to separate the liability from you, right? So um, any anything that happens under that entity you know, that entity is then liable for it, not you personally, right? So if something happens in your business, you don't personally want to get sued. And so as long as you are operating under this entity, for the most part, I mean, there's, you know, other things that you need to have in place um, that will help your case, which we'll talk about in just a second, but it separates that liability, right? So a lot of people will get started in their business, which is fine as what's known as a sole proprietor, right? Meaning you were just operating under your own name, you know, people are paying you directly. So oftentimes you'll find that this is the case with side hustles, right? I think about, um, I had a cousin who would like braid hair on the side, right? She didn't have a whole, you know, business entity set up for this. She didn't have an LLC. She was just her, <laughs> you know, it was just her name. She was just, you know, coming over people's houses, braiding their hair, and then people would just kind of pay her cash. And, you know, that was whatever it was, right? So in that instance, something like that, you are kind of operating as a sole proprietor. It's totally fine to do that in the beginning stages of your business, even as a coach. So I don't want you to feel like, you know, if you're coaching people and getting paid for it, you know, if you don't have your business entity set up that you're not legal, 
you are legal, you're just legally a sole proprietor. And so the issue with that is, again, should anything happen, you know, and heaven forbid you get sued, you are now personally liable, right? Like you are going to be named in that lawsuit versus your business entity. And in many cases for many people, that is going to be an LLC. So again, speak with an attorney to figure out what is the best legal uh, entity for you because there's more than one. But I'd say for most people, again, the most popular one here in the US is going to be an LLC. And they're not super expensive to set up. There's lots of services online that will help you set up. But I say you don't even really need to go to those services. I know when I was first setting up my LLC many, many ages ago, the first company um, that I ever created, and I have you know set up many LLC since then, I actually just went down to my Secretary of State office and you know printed out the paperwork online, filled it out in the office, and then paid them whatever the fee was. I think at the time it was like $250. So it's going to vary by state. Some states charge a lot more. I know California, I think, is very expensive. Um, some states charge a lot less. Generally, it's going to be a few hundred dollars, like two, three, four hundred dollars. Again, I think in California, because there's other fees involved, it could be, um, it could get up there. It could be pretty pricey. But uh, for the most part, this is something that you can do for yourself. Now, now, me at this stage in the game, I will reach out to my attorney and have them set up LLCs for me just because I want to make sure that every I is dotted, every T is crossed, and I want to make sure that my um, documents are in place. So you're going to need to create you know, an operating agreement and there's other uh, paperwork that kind of needs to be created at the same time that you are filing the LLC. Again, you can do it yourself. There's even like AI tools now that will help you um, create your operating agreement. So you don't have to work with an attorney, but you know, I kind of recommend it if you can uh, spring for it because you just want to make sure that everything is set up correctly and you know you can file your own LLC and you know do it incorrectly or you know not have everything in place that the state is looking for you to have in order for it to be you know an active ongoing concern as you know the state will likely uh, say when it comes to your LLC so you know consider using an attorney but uh, whether you go with an LLC or a different business entity that is the first thing that you'll want to set up in order to you know legally get your coaching business started. All right, the next thing that you'll want to do, and this is in part why I recommend getting that formal business entity. And again, even if you are, you don't have a business entity and you're just operating under your own name, technically you are still legal. You're just a sole proprietor, which is not good from a liability standpoint. But another reason why I recommend getting an actual business entity, and again, for most people, um, it's going to be an LLC because it's the most popular, is because the next thing you'll want to do is set up a business bank account. And you want to do this ASAP so that you don't get in trouble with the IRS or whatever tax entity is you know, the tax man in your country or your jurisdiction, because I know I have people from all over the world who are watching these videos. So you will want to set up a separate bank account, right? Not your personal account. So when someone is looking at your books, they should not see charges for, you know, DoorDash, grocery, um, shopping, like all the random things that you do. And then also your business expenses, right? You want to have those separate. And the easiest way to have it separate is just simply to create a business bank account. But you'll find that many banks again, will want to see your legal paperwork regarding your business entity. So I know every time that I set up a new business bank account, they're going to ask me for, you know, my articles of incorporation, my um, LLC documents, my operating agreement. Like they want to know that I'm like legit registered with the state and I actually have a business entity. Um, so they'll ask for that information. Now there are some banks that will allow you to set up what's known as a sole proprietor bank account. Again, if you're just operating under your own name, you know, they kind of treat it like a business account, but not really because if you're a sole proprietor, technically you're in business, but again, all that liability, you know, falls on you. So there are banks that will do it, but most banks like to, uh, you know, extend business bank accounts to legit businesses that actually have a business entity because there's, um, many other advantages from a finance standpoint that come along with that, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But again, the two kind of go hand in hand. So you want to set up your legal entity. And then as soon as you have that paperwork done, or as soon as you get that email that says you are now, you know, officially whatever entity you choose, you know, with your business name, the next thing you'll want to do is run down to uh, your local bank, or maybe there's a, another bank that is better for you in business. And you'll want to go open up a business bank account.
All right, so something else that you'll need to do that I'll kind of put as 1A, right? So the first thing that you need to do is set up an entity, but at least here in the US, this usually happens at the same time that you're setting up that entity. Again, you'll wanna do whatever is the equivalent in your country if you're watching from outside of the US, but you'll wanna set up an EIN number or an employer identification number. This is essentially a type of tax ID that again, lets the tax man know, lets the IRS, the Uncle Sam, whatever you wanna call it, lets them know that you have an entity, it's gonna be generating money, and you again, want that separate. So it's like a number, it's almost like a social security number, for your business, right? So you have a social security number, your business has a social security number too, it's called an EIN. These are free to set up, it takes five seconds to set these up, you can go to irs.gov and set them up, but again, you'll want to have your business entity set up first because it's gonna be connected to the business entity. So you get your legal business entity together and then you go to the IRS and then you set up your EIN. Again, none of this is legal or tax advice, but that's the next thing that you'll want to do because it leads us into the second step that you need to take, which is you'll want to to get a business credit card. Now, I know there's some people who are like, oh, this isn't a necessary step and it's not necessary to be legal. And that's true, like, you know, you're legal even without a business credit card. But I'm like, my goodness, if I could just grab people by the shoulders and shake them, you need to do this, okay? I, I talk about this a lot on the channel. I understand that from a consumer standpoint or from an employee standpoint, you know, debt is bad. Don't get credit cards, don't get into credit card debt. That is the mindset that we are often taught in the middle class. And it's a good mindset to have because you only have, right, one source of income, right, your job. And if you max out and you put all this stuff on a credit card and you know your income can't pay that, then you're gonna find yourself in trouble really quick. But you need to understand that when you are operating as a business, that shifts. And there will be times when you have business expenses that are going out, but cash flow is not coming in. And maybe you've signed, you know, five clients and they're all gonna pay you next week. Or maybe you have clients that are on a monthly retainer and they're paying you monthly. And so you know that, you know, those quote unquote accounts receivables are on the way, they're coming in, but you have expenses now that you need to pay. This is why it's important that you get that business credit card because it is going to cover the shortfall, right? And this is an acceptable practice to do in business. Again, I know from like a employee consumer standpoint, it's like, oh my goodness, no, that's bad. You shouldn't pay those expenses. But in business, that's not how it works. In order to keep the lights on in your business and in order to keep things going, you know, your marketing running, maybe you're running ads, maybe you are paying for a website. Like you don't want your website to go down or your ads to stop or any of this other software that you're paying for. Maybe you're paying for email marketing software. Like you don't want everything to shut off because you haven't paid it because you're waiting on money to come in from a client. Again, part of being in business is maintaining that consistency and that professionalism. And so oftentimes how we do this in business is through lines of credit, right? And so the easiest credit product to get when you are just getting started, especially when you're pre-revenue in your business and you haven't made any money, is getting a business credit card. Oftentimes when you go to the bank and you set up your business bank account, they will ask you at the same time, do you wanna apply for a business card? And most people say no, because they're like, oh, debt is bad, you know, I don't want a credit card. Listen, even if you don't think you're gonna use it, get that business credit card because oftentimes it comes in handy for you at times when you least expect it. It's also really great when you are dealing with vendors, right? Maybe there's a new vendor that you've never worked with before. You know, they're promising the world you're gonna sign up for their services. You wanna have that business credit card because it's an added layer of protection. If you were just wiring money and, you know, there's a disagreement or something happens or you don't, you know, they don't ship out what you paid for or whatever, they just ghost you you're kind of out of that money and you're gonna to have to fight with the bank or you know go through legal routes where if you have a business credit card, you know you can charge that back. You wanna protect yourself from fraud, right? And then I personally love them because you rack up travel points. So if you're into traveling the way I am, in fact, I have a video that you can check out here, which is all around how I build international travel into my business, you will rack up airline miles so quickly if you are using the right business credit card. So go ahead and get a business credit card. Oftentimes, again, when you are uh, first opening that bank account, they're gonna give you some money. I mean, I've seen, as long as your credit is decent now, now you, you need to have a decent credit score, but as long as your credit is decent, I've seen you know, business banks give $7,500, $10,000 to a brand new business account that hasn't made any money, just as kind of like a tester to say like, okay, here you go. Go ahead and uh, you know run your business. We'll see how you do. And then oftentimes they will automatically increase that limit. The more successful you are, the more sales that you make. But it's really great to just have that in your back pocket because you never know when you're gonna need it. 
All right, so by this point, you should have your legal entity set up, you should have your tax ID number, you got a, a business bank account, and hopefully you've got that business credit card. Well, the next thing that you need to get in place is some bookkeeping software, right? And so technically, yes, you can do this on your own via um, you know, Excel spreadsheets, if you're very technical like that and you love spreadsheets, but you need some sort of system in order to manage and track your finances. And I put this again in this legally setting up your business category because legally, when you pay taxes of the, at the end of the year, you are going to need to demonstrate, you know, that these were actually business expenses. And so if you have bookkeeping software, or you're working with a bookkeeper, you know, there's really popular ones like uh, QuickBooks, Xero. Um, when I first started in my business, I really loved Wave because it was free and it integrated with my bank accounts and it was very easy to categorize expenses. But you want some sort of tool or some sort of software that helps you categorize those expenses so that heaven forbid, should Uncle Sam or whatever the tax authority is, and your country come to you and say, mm, we want to audit your books. Are these really business expenses? You can easily point to everything and say, yep, on this date, this is what I spent money on. This is how it was related to my business. And you're not like coming up with things just off the top of your head. You want all of that documented and you want to keep really clean records. This is also going to be helpful again, as your business grows and you look to, you know, do more with your business bank, right? So uh, maybe in the beginning, you just have a business bank account and maybe a business credit card, but you might even want to go back to your bank and get a business line of credit, especially if your business is growing and you're looking to hire staff. And yes, even in an online business or a coaching business, you might have a new coaching program that you're releasing that is going to have, you know, staff that help you really fulfill on that coaching program and maybe facilitate in it. And before you've made sales, maybe you need to hire them and get them going. And so you need to pay them, right? But you haven't, you know, sold the coaching program yet. So you're kind of, you know, in between two spots. That's where something like a line of credit would be really helpful, where a line of credit is almost like a loan product, right? So it's not necessarily a credit card, even though sometimes they come with a card, but it's really um, the bank advancing you money so that you can make payroll or maybe make larger expenses that you wouldn't pay on a credit card. And then you have favorable terms for paying that back off. So maybe if it takes you three months to get your program up together or whatever, and then you sell it and then you get the money, then you can pay off that line of credit and it's still there for you. So you've paid it off. And then if you ever need to dip into it again, you can dip back into it. So line of credit products are really helpful to have, but a bank is not going to extend that to you if you don't have accurate records and documentation. They're going to want to know, you know, what is your revenue? What are your expenses? What are the assets on your balance sheet? And so again, it's so important that you have bookkeeping software, or at least a bookkeeping spreadsheet to keep track of all of this stuff from the very beginning, because they're also going to want to see a history, right? Of how you have done this in your business. And so having that history is going to be very helpful. So make sure that you get some sort of business um, bookkeeping software or uh, spreadsheets. Again, there's so many tools out there. Many of them are inexpensive or even free that you can use to get started, but don't try to run your business legally without having some sort of bookkeeping system in place. All right, so now you have your business entity set up, you got your business bank account, hopefully you have a business credit card and you've got your bookkeeping. One of the most important things you need to have, even though I'm putting this last, but I'm just putting it in order of how you'll probably set this up, is you wanna have your coaching contracts in place. Yes, you wanna have actual contracts. So again, I know in the beginning, maybe you are coaching family and friends, maybe they're paying you in, in your own name, they're you know, giving you a few hundred bucks um, for some coaching sessions just so that you can practice. You know, I get it, that's fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But when you start really growing, you start accepting like real clients who don't know you, who aren't family and friends, and especially if these clients are paying uh, you know, significant money, you wanna have a coaching contract in place that again, this protects you. So it protects you in a few ways. One, it protects you because it outlines exactly what the client is going to get so that there is no confusion. You don't want a client coaching with you over the course of some months. And then they're like, well, I thought I was going to get this, but we ended up doing this. And then they're like, you know, upset with you, right? So your coaching contract is going to clearly outline what this is, right? And what this isn't, but it also protects you because in the coaching contract, it states that the client is entering into this agreement with your company, right? Not you personally. And so it just points back to the first thing we talked about in terms of having a separate business entity. Again, for most people, it's going to be an LLC. That contract states that the client is entering in, into an engagement essentially with your LLC or whatever your business entity is. And so it's just, uh, you know, dotting those I's, crossing those T's. It's an added layer of protection for you. It's an added layer of protection for your clients. And it just makes it so that everybody knows what they are getting, what the price points are. This is important for you, especially 
especially if you were going to be doing payment plans, right? Maybe you have a long-term coaching engagement and maybe you're charging, um, I don't know, $6,000 for your coaching engagement, but you have agreed to let the client pay you $500 a month, right? You want to have that spelled out in your coaching contract, including what happens if the client doesn't pay, what happens if the client ghosts you, what happens if the client um, lapses on some payments, are you going to charge late fee? Like, all of that needs to be spelled out in your contract because it holds both of you accountable to the agreement that you are entering into. And again, it really just legitimizes uh, what you are doing. So make sure that you have a coaching contract in place when you are seriously dealing with clients. I get it. You're coaching your mama. You're probably not going to give her a contract. You're coaching your best friend, your best friend's neighbor, sister. I get it when we're just getting started, but you know, when people start, you know, coming off the street, right. Or they, uh, you know, see your content on social media and they're like, Oh, I want to work with you. Make sure you have a coaching contract in place. All right. I know I said the last one was the last one, right? Those coaching contracts, but I have a bonus one that I want to talk about that. I don't see a lot of people mentioning on social media or, you know, videos like this, and that is general liability insurance, right? So, you know, if you have all the other things in place that we talked about, your entity, your bank account, your bookkeeping software, your contract, like you're legally in business, right? But I strongly recommend that you get an insurance policy. And so um, you might do this over time, maybe after your first year in coaching. If you can swing for it uh, when you're just getting started, and again, this is not legal advice or even consulting advice. I'm just saying, you know, what I did in my own business, right? You know, just to be honest, those first few years when I was getting started, I was diligent to make sure that I had that business entity, I had the business bank account, I had my contracts and all of that. But it wasn't until I was a few years in that I was like, oh, I wonder if I should have business insurance. And the answer is yes, you should have business insurance. So there's something called general liability insurance. And this is just an added layer of protection that protects you. Um, and you want, you might want to get insurance based on the types of things that you're doing. Like maybe you host events, right? What if someone slips and falls in your event, right? Do you have event insurance? Do you have general liability insurance? It's just an added coverage that goes over your business so that should anything happen in the normal course of you doing business that you can go to your uh, insurance company who will pay out any claims that result from that, right? So you have all these layers of protection. You're operating not under your personal name, but in a business entity. Everything is clearly separated and organized. That way, again, should there be a legal dispute, you can prove and you can say this money was not going to my personal account. It was going to my business account. I have all my bookkeeping records that shows that I was operating, you know, this big business, you know, legally and, you know, according to all tax laws, I had a contract in place that stated all of these things. And then on top of that, I have my business uh, insurance policy that is going to, you know, financially protect me so that, you know, even if my business is responsible for something, I don't have to bankrupt my business, right? I can, uh, you know, go to my insurance provider and they can pay out that claim for me. So um, there's a lot of different um, companies that you can work with. Um, I do recommend getting an insurance broker. Um, I have an insurance broker who helps me not just with uh, insurance for my uh, general liability business insurance, but also um, insurance on my rental properties, right? Insurance um, on cars that I have in my business name, um, event insurance. Um, sometimes when you are doing big business with like, say the government or large corporations, if you get to that uh, place, maybe you pitch a, I don't know, a hundred thousand dollar contract for, you know, a company that's going to have you come in and do coaching for its leaders or something like that. Sometimes they will um, want you to be bonded, right? Which is a whole nother layer and level of insurance. So it's kind of outside of the scope of this video, but I just say that to say, it's not a bad idea to start developing a relationship with an insurance broker versus just going online and signing up for some insurance because that broker is almost like an insurance consultant for you. Um, they, they can, and help you come to the best um, decision about what type of insurance you need based on the type of business that you're doing. And they can oftentimes negotiate more favorable contracts for you with the insurance company so, not, so that you are not paying super expensive um, insurance rates. So think about working with an insurance broker, but above all, make sure you get general liability insurance. All right. Thanks so much for watching this video. I hope it was helpful for you. If you're like ready to go and you're like, oh my goodness, I cannot wait to truly launch my coaching business and I want to do it the right way. Another thing that I would recommend that you check out is my coaching certification program. Yes, my CLS certification and CLS actually stands for coach of life success because that is the designation that you're going to walk away with in the certification program. But I am so proud of it. It's basically a soup to nuts program that shows you not only how to coach, right? And you walk away with a coaching certification that is accredited and granted by us, but it is accredited by a third party um, accreditation company. But on top of that, we teach you how to come up with your own coaching methodology. We show you how to pack 
package it up into your own coaching program. And we even have an option within the certification where we can show you how to build out your brand completely from scratch and sell it and make lots of money and be super successful and really be the next big thing in your industry. So if you're interested in learning more about that, you can click the link below in order to sign up for a call with my enrollment coordinators who will walk through the entire process with you. But with that, thanks so much for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe. Also make sure that you are following me on Instagram and TikTok. Yes, I finally am on TikTok. I am Courtney L. Sanders on both of those platforms. You can check me out there. But with that, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.